Welcome to our Tech Daily webinar series. My name is Ruth Ann Marley and I am with Speaker Relations with Tech Canada. Today we have a very special guest and before I go ahead and introduce him, I want to draw your attention to those of you logging in that we have a handout and it should be in the right hand portion of your screen on the click right below the question box. So if you want uh, to download that now or print it, if you have the availability to do that, if not, it will be available after the, after the re session. Sorry, more coffee I think is required at this point. <laughs> <laughs> If you have questions during the presentation, I would encourage you to write them into the question box and Ryan has agreed to make some time to answer the questions. So we will be doing that at the conclusion. We'll make about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to do that. So I would like to introduce now Ryan Walter. Many of you who are Canadians and hockey fans will know Ryan as he was named Team Cap Canada Captain for the World Junior Tournament. He, was, he played in the NHL All-Star Game for Team Canada for four championship seasons. So I think hockey began and springboarded Ryan's career, but as a true Renaissance man, that has not been the end of it. He has continued to be instrumental in hockey in BC with the, um, with the Burnaby Club there. He is also an author of several books and has been an advisor, an actor for television and movies for over 20 years. So without further ado, Coach, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ruth, Ann, and uh, hello to everybody uh, in the Tech Nation here. Um, and many of you I have had the opportunity to, you know, to spend time with. Yeah, we live in an interesting age, don't we? I mean, let's get right at it here. Uh, yesterday, I saw this headline in, in, uh, on the CBC website, you know, NHL considering an August return. Like, our world is upside down. I isn't it really crazy when you think of um, hockey in August, you know, and you think of, you know, nobody in the building? So I had to, you know, we have to have a little bit of fun with this. So I, I, a friend of mine sent me this the other day. It was titled, uh, Six Feet Apart is Better Than Six Feet Under. <laughs> uh, half of us are going to come out of this quarantine as amazing cooks. The other half will come out with a drinking problem. Uh, I need to practice social distancing from my refrigerator. And my favorite is homeschooling is going well. Two students suspended for fighting and one teacher fired for drinking on the job. So it is a, a very interesting place that we live right now. And what we wanted to do is just, I'm gonna give you a little bit of hockey trivia and a little bit of hockey video just to, uh, to get you going because everybody's looking at that and for that. But how about that one? Somebody sent me this the other day. You know, I'm obviously um, uh, many years since I retired in 1993. Yeah, I'm an old guy. Uh, and I didn't know that stat. That is crazy that, uh, you know, Bobby Smith uh, in 1978 was the first overall pick and, and I was fortunate to be the second overall pick. So I had no idea that we, we were in that range. And uh, obviously, I'm not sure I fit in with some of those names, but uh, lots of fun. And then how about a little bit of, a little bit of action here? There you go. Finally, we get some hockey. And uh, that's the old Montreal Forum. So that was, a, that was an awfully fun place to play the game of hockey. And sorry, hockey fans, that's all you get. That was every goal I ever scored. So <laughs> we'll leave it alone. So we're gonna talk uh, this morning about leading me and leading others. And would we agree, leaders, that the first position, the first place of leadership is with ourselves? If we can't lead ourselves, it's hard to expect other people to really, you know, not only follow us, but increase their leadership position. And I wanted to give you one more video here. This is uh, a fun little video. Let me just make sure that's working for you. I'm gonna, this happened to me before. There we go. I'll put it on here. So you're going to see uh, a penalty shot here. And if you're seeing that, and I think you are, 
<laughs> That's a pretty cool video. You got to see that one more time. Let's talk about it. So, so watch how happy this uh, this goalie is. Look at him, He's very happy. <laughs> All right, so why do I bring you that today? You know, leaders, here's the challenge as we think about leading us. Would we agree, leaders, the number one thing that we've got to focus on as we get up in the morning, we grab our coffee, is we've got to think about how do we stay in the game, right? We're in a hard game right now. You know, some of you, it's harder than others. Um, I have a couple of clients uh, who have, you know, laid off, hundreds and hundreds of people. I have another couple of clients who are flying right now, right? Like depending on what industry, when I say flying, I mean accelerating their business because depending on what industry, uh, there's, there's huge impact either way. Uh, why do we have to stay in the game as leaders? And that's a challenge to you and that's a challenge to me. Well, I think the first principle of leadership in 2020 is that our people emulate our game, our, our, our game. I'm gonna call it our game. And our people emulate our energy. So as we show up, and, and you know what's interesting, we're gonna talk about this throughout our time together um, uh, on, this, on this webinar, is we show up differently now, don't we? So, so how, should our, how should our voice now, you know, be the thing that you know connects energy with people how should our you know the zoom call or the go to meeting call like what kind of energy do we bring because our people emulate our energy number two is uh, we're going to take some different shots on net we want to talk about that today right this thing's changed you know that even more than we don't know that that's why you're on this call that's why you're on this webinar so we're going to take some new shots on net, and I think that's a, a, an absolutely fun and critical part of leadership, is that during this time we can be creative, and then a little bit like that guy taking the shot in the world of soccer. Uh, the ball hits the crossbar and it bounces. It looks like it bounces out, but it bounces back into the goal. And isn't that true? This is my life, leaders. <laughs> right? Eventually the balances are going to go our way. We know that. That's how we built our business. That's how we built our family. We know that in life. So we're going to stay in the game. We're going to find ways to do that throughout our time together. We're going to take some new shots on net. And then uh, obviously we're going to set this thing up. The bounces are going to come our way. So as you start to think about uh, leading others, uh, I saw a great uh, article here recently uh, by Gallup. And uh, Jim Harder uh, put together some of these stats. So in the time of crisis, there are two directions that human nature can take us, right? Uh, fear, hopelessness, and victimization, or self-actualization and engagement. We're gonna, we're gonna actually look at, at you know, the different, we're gonna name this, we have five mindsets that sort of talk to this part of uh, your people and the way that they see life, the frame that they look through, the frame that they communicate through. Uh, but how about that bottom part? On the latter, if leaders have a clear way forward, human beings are amazingly resilient. There is a documented rally effect. And what Gallup has done is they've looked at crisis, right, from way back, and they've, they've logged, you know, so what, what do leaders have to do? And this is a very interesting piece for me because I think as we think of the crisis that we're in, um, how do we as leaders know? How do we have a clear path forward? Some of us don't. That's the hardest part of leadership is knowing what's coming when none of us know what's coming. So, so we're going to have to chunk it down and we're going to talk about those little steps that we can take to try to get our people up into that place where there's less fear, there's less helplessness, and obviously we don't want our people in, in this area of victimization, okay? The other thing that Gallup has found, it won't surprise you, is that uh, there's four universal needs, and, and if you're a leader, uh, you know this already, and it's a great reminder, though, as you <clears throat> talk to people over the phone, 
as you connect to people, you know, online, uh, obviously it, it's a hard one, right? People can't watch your behavior at this point. So uh, we're going to discuss how, how then can we influence people. And these areas are still important, whether they come over the phone or they come over online. So trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the first and the, and the fourth, right? This idea of, of, you know, really focusing in on how do we make sure that our people uh, have a glimpse at the future, where we're at, where we're going. <clears throat> and then compassion, there's a lot talked about around empathy, leadership and empathy during this time. And I'm sure many of you are thinking through that process and how to deliver it. John Maxwell uh, is a guy that I read, and I'm not a Maxwellite, but he has good stuff. And he says, leadership is influence. So let me ask you this. Uh, games changed, right? How do you influence over the phone? <laughs> How do you influence over go to meeting, over Zoom, over Skype? All right, let, let's talk about some of those pieces because I think that's, this is what's on the, the, the minds of people across the world right now. And then Covey says that, right? That leadership's not as a choice, it's not a position. So as we think about leading us and leading others, uh, there's a little um, thing that says this, little quote by uh, Viktor Frankl sets it all up. And this is really the work that I love doing because I think this is the effect that we can have on every person, you know, whether it's our kids, our spouse, our community, or our, our company, uh, is this is the effect right here. So between stimulus and response, there's a space. This is a brilliant thought by Frankel. In that space is our power to choose our response, and in our response lies our growth and our freedom. So we want to spend a little bit of time uh, today thinking about how can we have influence on our people's space? How can we make choices or help them make choices, right, that will uh, be the right choice between the stimulus and response in this very interesting crisis that we're leading? So we'll have some fun there. Uh, I think, you know, I'll just go back a little bit that I played for the the Capitals love that opportunity, but here's what I want to tell you, is that what came between stimulus and response <laughs> for, for uh, most of us in the Washington Capitals during those days, because we lost a lot, we were not a good team, was this concept of blame. And when we blame others, here's what I've learned, and I learned this the hard way, is we give all of our opportunity to change away. So in other words, we're not focused on our change. We're focused on blaming others. Got into Montreal, it was traded to the Montreal Canadiens. And, and you know, when I think of stimulus and response, that little, you know, frame that I was sort of, that guided the way I played in Montreal was much different. And in, in Montreal, there was much more of this idea that, you know, you just find a way to win right, that, that you are highly accountable because there was lots of pressure in Montreal to win. And that change, that space, the way we framed that space was different. And, uh, you know, I talked to Bobby Smith the other day. So Bobby's the tall guy, number 15 there. There's Chris Chelios. I don't know if I scored or if Matt Nazan scored, but uh, that's a fun reminder. And uh, Bobby Smith said that, you know, he read a, um, a book on JFK earlier in his, uh, just after he, he, he got out of his, or came out of his NHL career. And Bobby uh, said that uh, JFK's favorite poem, and let me read it to you, was this. Bullfight critics, row on row, line the enormous plaza full, but there is only one who knows, and he's the one who fights the bull. And you know, leaders right now for you and for I, for us, uh, that's us, right? Sorry to touch my, no my nose there, I wash my hands. That's us. So we're in the, you know, we're, we're in the plaza, we're, we're in on the ice, we're in the arena. 
very thankful to have uh, won that cup in 86. And I've told the story to many of you. I'm just going to review quick. 23rd of May, 1986, we get a chance to win that cup. And I don't know if you can see it. Ruth Ann asked me to bring that Stanley Cup ring. Uh, sorry you can't put it on, but next time we get together, you can. And in the 23rd of May, we were struggling as a team. And, and this is such a good metaphor for me because really the question is what happened. And the cool thing is we didn't fire anybody. We didn't, you know, no personnel changes. The coaches stayed. The thing that happened was in the inner game. And we're going to talk about that today. How do you influence the inner game? We're going to call it, we're going to talk about a performance process. We're going to talk about a mindset shift. And then we're going to give you some very practical ways from science to do that. So the things that change are not off, not always the external circumstances. So how can you and I have influence on the inner game of our people? And, and how can we help them make good choices through this time? Got into the Vancouver Canucks and, and really enjoyed it. Jenny and I, as many of you know, stayed out here, grew our kids. We have five amazing kids, five amazing grandkids. And uh, that's our career in a nutshell. Now, here's where I am right now. I hate to do this to you, but we are self-isolating in a place called Thetis Island. We've uh, purchased a, a leadership retreat on Thetis Island. And, uh, you know, outside of COVID-19, this is where clients come to us for their meetings and their training. And, uh, you know, I'm not there now, but that's the deck that we get a chance to train on and and live on so there you go a little glimpse of uh where we're at so i'd like to start us off leaders and and i like what ruth ann said please fire away questions into the into the questions area and uh, ruth ann and i will connect and make sure that we uh we nail most of these questions if not all of them but i want to i want to do a quick review especially for some that have maybe uh you know done a couple of our sessions with tech and if you're new to tech, this will this will go quick, but it'll give you a glimpse of some of the depth of things that we're doing. Uh, we call it the process, the performance process. Let's get on the same page <clears throat> on how your people, even at home, are going to create high performance. So certainly the results are important, and whether we're in the office or we're from home, uh, we've got to generate results. <clears throat> Excuse me. Here's the interesting point. World of Sport tells us that championship habits deliver championships. That is such a powerful piece. So the habits that we generate and that we accumulate actually create the performance of our lifetime. Okay. Now the action that we practice often delivers the habits that give us the results. And why do, we, why do we separate those two? Because action is conscious thought, habits are unconscious thought. And so I wanna make sure that we're talking through both those concepts that deliver our results. And here's the aha moment for me. All action comes out of belief system. This is crazy. All action comes out of what we believe. So you wanna rem remember that as you're leading people from afar. Uh, as you're talking and as you're, you know, um, thinking about motivating a team from afar, uh, how do you have a high effect on their inner game, their belief system, right? Their mindset. And this is where we want to go a little bit deeper. So the inner game of, of every person, your workers, NHL players, is the key indicator of their outer results. So the question that leaders are asking all across the world is how can I have influence on belief system and mindset, right? Even though I'm not there, even though they can't see me, even though they don't see my emotion. So this, we'll, we'll walk through this and we'll have some fun. I wanna add a layer, a little bit of a learning, and this is from science. There's a guy by, by the name of uh, BJ Fogg. And, and he says, and I'd love you to write this down. He says B equals MAP, okay? So B equals MAP. So write that down because I think this really connects with where we wanna go as we think about, you know, 
influencing positive energy from afar. So behavior, it, it really comes from three factors. And I like this idea, motivation, ability, and prompt. And so obviously motivation, we understand. Ability, right? Can we do what we're doing? And for many of your workers, some of them might not have the, um, you know, might not be up to speed on maybe their their computer or their portable computer or other things like, you know, go to meeting or Zoom. So there could be an ability piece there and then prompt. And so I wanna focus in as we do some stuff together here today on motivation. So how do you do that by, you know, from afar? and prompt give you a, a good example on prompt um, i have a very small you know gluten issue uh, i'm not you know gluten adverse so i just it's not good for me uh, but if i see bread <laughs> i want bread i love bread for me bread is a prompt okay so you're gonna see prompts in people right in places and in things so I want to hone in on, on, you know, motivation and prompt. Keep those three in mind as you think about influencing behavior from afar. We've done some big work in this area of metacognition. We're going to talk lots about that right now. Uh, this idea of, of influencing people's thinking about their thinking, that's going to be a powerful piece. And we're going to bring you uh, a couple of ideas from our, our own model uh, around the five mindsets that you can try to work to influence, um, you know, from a distance. Okay. Very quickly, uh, 609580, this is our little principle. So if you want to write that down on a piece of paper, uh, here's what I've learned from neuroscience is that the, at the upper end, we have around 60,000 thoughts a day. Uh, the lower ends in around 17. So we have between 17,000 and 60,000 thoughts a day. That's a lot of thoughts. 95% uh, of those thoughts we had yesterday. So if you're thinking negative to, about the COVID-19 virus yesterday, you're probably gonna have that same opinion today. Your thinking doesn't change a lot. That's why trying to increase or influence positive momentum uh, during this crisis is something that's gotta be on your mind every day, every day, every interaction. Uh, and then 80% of those 95% of the 60,000 thoughts you have on a daily basis, you already know this one, right? Are negative thoughts. 80% of the 95% of the 60,000 thoughts you have on a daily basis tend to be negative thoughts. If you do no training in this area, and this is really the training that uh, my wife Jenny and I do with many of the tech companies across Canada, is that we actually help your people understand the thinking that they bring to work so that they can shift that thinking, they can adjust their mindset. So this sets up our little, uh, we call it our thinking tendencies model. I wanna give this to you quickly. If you've seen it before, we're gonna go through it quickly. It's a good reminder. And then at the end, we have a, a little bit of a, a piece of science that we wanna add to it to give you a bit of a new flavor around the model. So we have positive thoughts, we have negative thoughts, we have past thoughts, we have future thoughts. And um, on this one, Ruth Ann, uh, I'm gonna ask a question around uh, some of these mindsets. And if there's some uh, answers, you can just uh, fire, them, fire them in here. So here's the question I wanna ask you at the very bottom, uh, that we call that past negative thinking. So at the very bottom left, could you actually write in, if you printed out this, this little uh, brochure or this little um, uh, handout, could you write in past negative thinking? So that's the first of five mindsets. We'll go quick here, but, but give us, as you're thinking about past negative thinking, uh, give us uh, on the little question area, some of your descriptors. What is past negative thinking? How do you describe it? And if you have some thoughts, just fire them in there. Uh, past negative thinking, like what are the key areas that come to mind? And how would you describe that? Okay, so if you get some of these, Ruthann, just fire away. 
I'm going to I'm keep going here. Yeah. Okay. I've got three. So, all right. First one from Julia is I failed once. I'm going to fail again. We've Ooh, got very good regrets, shame. Big one there. Wow. Victim. Wow, our team. Yep. That is fabulous, Ruth Ann. Our, our team on, is, is brilliant and quick. So a couple key indicators, regret, right? Blame, failure. Th these are the disappointments of our life down in past negative thinking. So, so here's what we want to say, leaders, is that some of your people, whether they're in your building or they're working from afar, will have this mindset at times, right? They will slip into past negative thinking. Okay, it's one of five new pieces of language we want to give you, and it's one of five new areas that we want you to think about as you think about actually uh, inspiring your workforce from afar. Now, the cool thing about past negative thinking, even though these are the regrets of our lives, here's the good news. If we can see past negative thinking through a, a, what we call a learning lens or a learning frame, we can actually move that up into what we're going to call future positive process. Okay, so past negatives, not all negative. And I'm going to go very quick here. As you can tell, this is a full day session you're going to get in 15 minutes. Let's move to the bottom right. So uh, you know where the model's going, right? Future negative thinking, okay? And future negative thinking, write that in there in the bottom right, future negative thinking uh, is something that I want you to describe. So how would you describe future negative thinking? Fire in your ideas into questions. And as Ruth Ann's getting those, can I just say that if we're in past negative thinking, I put the word in there, it can deflate the energy of our people, whether that's in our office, or in their home, okay? So if we're in a negative mode in this past negative thinking, it can deflate our energy. But give us, uh, let's move on to future negative thinking, bottom right, give us some of those. Any uh, indicators there, Ruthann? Absolutely, so I think the number one, uh, one that's coming up for several people is a fear of success and alternately a fear of failure. But the fear of success really comes in very strongly Mm. Um, it's not my, I, I can't, I don't have the right people. I can't, I, I can't trust mm. somebody else. It, it's not my business. I wow. doubt my ability to succeed. And again, that's that fear of failure. Um, and a little bit of, you know, self, self doubt and uncertainty. And number one, oh. it's not going to work. I'm going to awfulize <laughs> Uh, awfulizing is one of my favorite phrases, awfulizers. And I think that's about everything. Yeah, Ruth Ann, thank you. So uh, leaders across Canada, you guys have done a brilliant job. Uh, put in uh, some indicators for future negative. Put in obviously fear, put in anxious, right? Put in worry. And can we just, it's good to identify future negative thinking because this is typically where most of your people are at, right? You cannot go through a crisis like this. Uh, I don't care who you are. I don't care how mentally tough you are without at least having some moments in future negative. You know, what will happen to my job? Uh, what will happen to my company? Uh, what will happen to my family, right? What will happen to me? And so there's gonna be a lot of future negative thinking. And as a leader uh, working to influence your workforce from afar, we want you to have some solutions for the future negatives of your people, okay? And we're going to talk through that a little bit. Future negative is fascinating. Um, this is an area, and, and by the way, this model will be in our next book, and we're excited about that next book, uh, probably going to be called Short Shifts. And we're going to talk about solutions to all five of these mindsets and then how to influence them in your people. Mark Twain said this about future negative, is, I love his thought. He said, if a cat steps on a hot stove, <laughs> the cat will never step on a hot stove again. 
but the cat will never step on a cold stove either. Isn't that crazy? Do you know where most of the success is uh, in the crisis and after the crisis is going to be with your team is on the other side of the cold stove. Well, we're not going to go there because we got burnt last time. Future negative thinking is where NHL teams lose Stanley Cups before they play. So we're going to spend lots of time, and, and I'll be doing some blogs on future negative thinking and how to, you know, as you come out of this crisis situation and into some normalcy, uh, how do you get your people out of future negative? Let's go quick. That paralyzes the energy of our team because, and, and let me say this, future negative is not all negative, right? As a leader, you actually have to go into future negative uh, on your own to look at the contingency plans of your business. So it's not all negative, but when it's in a negative mode, future negative paralyzes the energy of our people. Okay, in the top left, we, we're going to talk about past positive thinking. Leaders, one of the great opportunities of your leadership, uh, especially over the phone and, and over, you know, uh, social media, especially, you know, over online, is to remind people of the past positives that they've had, <clears throat> and that'll help regenerate the energy of your team. Okay, past positives are your wins, right, of what you did well. Uh, the world of, in the world of hockey, past positives are this idea of seeing your best on video. So how do you translate that into your business? You'll know. And then top right, put in the words future positive thinking. There is so much science now on future positive thinking, isn't there? And, and that, that activates the energy of our team. One of the things that we wanna try to, um, you know, just sort of articulate through these four pieces of language so far, is that as you are thinking about your online and your over the phone conversations, we're gonna give you in a minute a ratio of how much positivity to negativity needs to be in your culture. And can I say this now? In your conversations, right? There's a ratio that's gonna help your people hold on to your culture as you work from afar. And you need to think about how to activate that positivity in these conversations, okay? Now, Tony Schwartz says this, <clears throat> excuse me, love that thought. Uh, you know, so at the end of the day, as you're thinking about your people from afar, uh, the key component is energy. And I asked Elaine Vigneault, I'm standing with Elaine Vigneault there, as, uh, he's the head coach of the Vancouver Canucks. I got a chance to coach with Elaine as an assistant coach. And Elaine Vigneault, I once asked him, Elaine, what's the number one thing that an NHL head coach focuses on? And he never hesitated. He said, the energy of my team. Let me ask you the questions, leader, leaders. How do you know, right, from afar? How's the energy of your people? How do you influence the energy of your people through the conversations that you're having, okay? So uh, above the line, we're gonna supply a little more energy. We have to think through that concept uh, in this crisis. And we're gonna have some people that are gonna suck energy, for sure. That's gonna happen. That happened even when there wasn't a crisis, okay? Here's your ratio. Mar Marcia Luceda says that it, it's gonna take three positive interactions to every one negative interaction. Here's the key leaders. In the past, that wasn't just your voice, right? It wasn't just three positive words to one negative word. But can I say this online and over the phone? Uh, we're going to have to increase our words, our positive words. Agreed? Because now there's not the ability to see the interactions in our office. Uh, and then this is a, a brilliant one from John Gottman, uh, brilliant science a scientist in this primary relationship expert. And Gottman says it takes five positive interactions to every one negative interaction in our primary relationships. Now, John Gottman was talking mostly about marriage. So it's a 
five to one ratio. Three to one, we're in trouble. 0.77 to one in Gottman's research of 45 years, we're divorced. So is, is, is the positive to negative important? Absolutely, right? Um, am I giving you just a, a positive thinking model? No. But is positivity to negativity in each of our relationships? How about this? In each of our calls that we have with our team, important? 100%, okay? So a little bit of a, a look at, you know, just generally the frames of the model. I can, I can't. I'm thankful. I'd rather blame, right? Those are simple. And then we actually call our model, right? The offensive zone. I'm, you know, I'm playing offense, the defensive zone. I'm playing a little more defense. And we use the language. We have about a thousand companies now across North America that are actually using this language in their culture to drive deeper performance conversations. Socrates, that's a great thought. Yeah, good. And we know this, right, leaders? Especially during this time, it's how our people see the world. How can we have a high effect on the frame that our people are seeing our business, their family, and their world through? Okay. So are we focused, got our people focused on the win, or are we focused on the loss? That's such an important piece right now. Future positive is we're going to make that happen. It's not only outcome focus in future positive agreed, it's also process focus. And I think that's the great opportunity of leadership is to focus in the future positive on the process that gives us the win. At times we're drawn by the future that we want, and that's a good one. Or uh, I don't know if you're like me, I'm sometimes distracted by the past that I'm disappointed in. How about this one? in today's COVID-19 environment. Obviously, people are gonna be there. And then, you know, one of the ways that leaders can help re-energize your people is to focus them on their past wins, okay? Words count, agreed. Words in crisis really count. Do we see what we're going through as a threat or do we see it as a challenge? What a difference that makes in the conversations that we're having with our people. So be very uh, careful, very intentional around the words that you're using with your people. So why is it important to have a little more positivity, you know, three to one, five to one ratios? Well, if we can shift, we can increase uh, this idea of productivity, you know, 30 plus percent by moving from negative, neutral, or stressed up into a little more positivity. Uh, sales is not easy during this time, but in normal times that happens. And then if you're going to your doctor, make your doctor happy. That's uh, such a great reminder. So here's the fifth mindset. Could you actually write in, in the fifth area there? Uh, in the moment, right? We call it the flow zone. It's not past, it's not future. It's not really, you know, positive or negative. It just is, right? It's, it's in the moment. And leaders, we want to challenge you in this area. How well you've got people working from home, how do you help them prepare to increase flow in your business? And number two, how do you, how do you prote help them protect flow in their home as they do their work? Those are great questions to have conversations with your people around. What is flow? You know what it is, right? 100% focus, total inner clarity, you know, timelessness, intrinsic motivation. Remember this idea from BJ Fogg, behavior equals motivation, ability, and prompt. Okay, this is one of the areas uh, that we want you to think about from a, a, a high behavior, a high productivity uh, place is to increase flow, okay? People need to be challenged as they grow their skill. And I wanted to leave this with you. This is from Daniel Goleman, high performance, low performance, high stress, low stress in this time of COVID. 
So, you know, at times we're going to be in the fade mode, low stress, low performance. And would we agree, leaders, even we at times are going to get here. Science calls it frazzle. We're, we're high stress, low performance. And then isn't it good to know that flow is not no performance, right? Flow is an, is an, it's an, I'm sorry, not no stress. Flow is enough stress. So here's your challenge. How do you help your people dial back from the frazzle to flow? And how do you help your people dial up from fade to flow? Love you to think about your processes to influence that from a distance, okay? So that's our model, folks. Uh, we're playing offense, we're playing defense, right? We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to generate positivity over the phone. We're gonna try to increase our offense throughout our company in this very uh, hard time of playing defense. All right, we'll have some fun there. So here at the uh, very end, and I want to, I'm going to just take the next five minutes and then we'll open up for questions. I want to give you a bit of a, a piece on science. So some, uh, some ways that we can use our model, right? You can use positivity to negativity, that idea in, in a way that will help to uh, increase performance and adjust behavior. And we said we'd try to do that right at the beginning. <clears throat> By the way, this is a brilliant book, Think, Rethinking Positive Thinking, and uh, this lady, uh, this scientist, deserves a lot of credit. Uh, so I want to talk about mental contrasting. And we're, we'll spend some time thinking about this concept, and then we'll get really uh, practical. So what, what uh, Gabriella says is that, is it go to the outcome wish first. So don't, don't, Focus on the obstacle. Go to the desired change that you and your people want first. And if you're leading this on a telephone call, you might say to your employee, okay, what are the things that you want to change, right, in, in whatever part? Um, you know, what are the goals that you have today? And then go to the obstacle. So what are the things that would hold you back from uh, accomplishing that wish, that desire, that goal. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove to you why you need to do that in that order. And then build a plan to execute that, to get over the obstacle. Here's why. What they've done, the science has done a lot of work now and they, they call it reverse contrasting on the right. If you go to the obstacle and then you say, okay, what do you want after that? Apparently our brain doesn't, our non-conscious thinking doesn't pick that up as well. But if you can go to what's called mental contrasting, so you always drive your wish, your desire, your outcome, your change first, then go to the obstacle and, and create the tension between what you want and then the obstacle or what we might call the current reality of where you're at, then your brain works on it even at night. So here's, you know where we're going. <clears throat> what are your future positives? That'd be a great, you know, from the model, what are your future positives that you want to implement here today, this week, this month? And then what are the obstacles, the future negatives? It could be the worries, right? It could be the physical obstacles that are actually in the way for you to accomplish that goal. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then build a plan. If you're having trouble, and, and my wife Jenny and I have done a lot of work in this area, if, if only, you're having trouble to figure out what you want uh, or what your outcome goals are, have your people do this little thing. Go to the end of this crisis and see uh, all the areas that you wish that you would have done. Uh, that you wish you would have accomplished at the end of this crisis, and then come back and write a list, if only I. Here's how it worked with the Montreal Canadiens in the, in the 90s and the years in the, in the 2000s. I did some work with their team. We had them go to a season where they had a very tough season. And we said, yeah, write a list of, of things that you personally wish that you could have uh, accomplished and and we had them 
uh, frame that around if only I'd. Here's what they said. If only I'd listened to the coach. It's got to be personal. If only I, I didn't go to the bar so much. <laughs> if only I would have got more shots on net. So if only I'd is an interesting way to build a bit of a, a list of things that you might want to accomplish in the positive. <clears throat> and what, uh, what Gabriella suggests is that we go to our wish, we look at the outcomes that could come from that wish or that desire of change, then we look at the obstacles and we build a plan to fill, to get over the obstacle and into the outcome. Let's say this is her point. Let's say you, you know, the de desired wish was, you know, jogging when you get home or finish your, your work uh, at home. You know, uh, the best outcome is, uh, you know, it helps me feel way better. Uh, your obstacle is you get tired at the end of the day. So her point is, your plan is, and she uses if, if then plans. If I come home tired at 7 p.m., then I'll put on my running shoes and at least get outside. So there's an example of how science can help you accomplish the things that you need to accomplish from home and tie it in to the future positive, past positive opportunity. And, uh, and it really has an effect. So we wanted to take our model, our five mindset model, and give you some science around how to actually implement it. And as you can see here that the the WOOP, W-O-O-P, versus the control has some huge effect. Get your people uh, to actually, uh, you know, coach them around how to build the process where you look at your outcome desire, you come back to the obstacles, you create that tension in your mind for your non-conscious thinking, and then you build a plan to accomplish that. So that's a a simple process to get your future positives and your future negatives in a place where your brain is going to work on them. Okay? Lots of fun. Thanks for that. There's our overview. So we're going to stay in the game, right? We're going to we know that behavior equals motivation, ability and prompt. So want to think online over the phone how those work as we're thinking of our people. We looked at our thinking tendencies model. How do we influence the thinking, right? <clears throat> the focus, the belief system of our people uh, from afar, over the phone, over online. We're gonna help our people shift. One of the goals of the shift, and we've done a lot of work with the tech clients in this area, is to really talk about how can you help people shift? How do you help them shift their, their mindset? And then we can actually use mental contrasting, right? To be in that position where, uh, where we accomplish our goals through uh, science. And, uh, and then uh, just before we get to questions, uh, uh, Ruth Ann, uh, at the very end of the handout, I'd love to have some feedback. And, uh, and this is a place where people can go deeper with me. Um, love you to take that and you know you're welcome to just send me that a copy of it uh, leaders uh, I'd, I'd love to send you our e-newsletters that we're sending out uh, during this time we're doing them way more often it's on a, a weekly bi-monthly basis so that uh, so that you're getting good information on how to apply the model how to uh, how to lead energy and uh, we're doing lots of work there. So I'd love you to have that. That's a free give from us. We're also doing some work, uh, Ruth Ann and I were talking about this, with a, a bunch of Canadian clients now around uh, what we're calling lunch and learns. So a 50 minute, uh, very quick, you know, Zoom call uh, to all your people in your company. And it's just, you know, four or five times over the next four or five, um, you know, we're, I'm doing it with some clients, uh, you know, bi-monthly, others weekly. But the goal is to give good information like this and then answer questions and keep your people energized. So love you to think about that. Give me a, a shout, ryanwalter.com, or just go to ryanwalter.com and, uh, and send me a message. 
So I'd love you to just sort of be thinking about filling that out as we answer some questions. Ruth Ann, would we have some questions that we could answer over the next minutes? Absolutely. We've got about 10 minutes left, and I think that the reverse contrasting, re it's a new way of thinking for some people. Can, can you go back over that and, and provide a little bit more clarification on the step? Are you talking about going from the outcome and then leading backwards, or just, just flush that out a little bit more for people again? Absolutely. <clears throat> and it's always fun to have a visual, so I'll, I'll fire it up. So what we want to do and uh, and have a look at uh, the way that um, that uh, uh, the the book called Rethinking Positive Thinking actually uh, discusses this this scientific concept is we want to mental contrast. So that's the that's what we want to do. So the idea is, and it's a really reverse way of doing life is look at what you want first. So what are the changes that you want? What are the outcome desires that you have? And could, in my terminology, what are your goals, right? And, and make them personal. I wanna put that in as much as possible for your people. What are their personal goals? Then come back and spend some time. This could be for you, this could be you coaching your people. And then look at the personal obstacles that could be in the way of you accomplishing that goal. Then fill that gap with your plan. That's the goal, okay? So mental contrasting is goal first, obstacle second. Now, I like to use the word goal, and then I, used, I love to use the word for obstacle. I, I like to use the word opponent. <laughs> What's your opponent that you've got to get over, right? You've got to get through. Write a plan to do that. Often you can use, if this happens, then I will do this. So you can use if-then planning. Now, reverse contrasting, apparently from science, is not as effective. So if I go to my obstacle first, oh, I got issues, and here's all the issues that I've got, and I don't know if I'm going to get over this. And then I build the goal or the plan, you know, the desired outcome. Apparently, the brain does not take that tension as well and doesn't come up with the ideas that you need your brain to have. So that's the concept around mental contrasting and reverse contrast. That makes perfect sense because if you think of it from a fatigue point of view, and you talked about this mindset before, if you are looking at the challenges and you're living in the challenges or facing the opponent, you're already feeling some of those past negatives. So it's going to start weighing on you. Whereas if you start thinking of the outcome, your mind is already reframing that winner mentality, which will give you that energy to reverse the reverse the challenge to go backward to face the opponent. So that's that's an excellent point. Thank you, that's, that's really well put, Ruthann. And I'm gonna tie it in. Why we like this concept out of science is that it really ties into our model well, where you think of the future positives that you want in life, and you, you write those down and you journal them, and you, know, you create your goals for your day and all of that. And then underneath that, you bring in your future negatives. And so it really ties into the model very well. Excellent. And I'm just going to go back to your B equals MAP, right? Behavior equals motivation, ability, and prompting. A lot of people are, you, you talked about the five positives against the, the, the one negative. What, what might be some ways to sort of up the, up the, up the positivity to encourage people to really dial into the abilities and, and, and trigger those prompts? That's very good. So those are great, uh, great questions. Uh, here's a couple. And, and what we do in our, our second session is we dive into how to coach that energy. Uh, but here's, here's a simple one. Would we agree uh, that, that coaching often comes through brilliant questions? And that we actually increase metacognition, which is thinking about thinking through brilliant questions. So one of the things that I would challenge the leaders on this call to do over the phone, because we're often giving information, is to pause once in a while and think about coaching your people 
through asking questions. If you have some people that are down in that future negative zone and you're feeling it, you're hearing it over the, their voices and their conversations, here's a simple question that can help them get above the line or into the offensive zone. So this scenario that we're going through, where have you seen this go very well in the past? So the minute that they think about where it's gone well in the past or how they actually got over this obstacle in the past, they move up into past positive thinking and they start enunciating or voicing past positives back to you. So questions are really good. Uh, uh, we call them shifters of energy. And that would be something I'd love your leaders, Ruth Ann, to think about. What are the key questions you can write down that you could utilize and send me a note at ryanwalter.com and I'll send you some that I have uh, and we can brainstorm uh, you know, over an email or, or over the phone around key questions that actually shift energy over the conversation of, of the, or the calls that you're having. It's funny, you and I started uh, before the broadcast talking about how important questioning was. And what I what I heard there, and so just sort of, uh, you know, fo follow up on that, is that it's not just the questioning, it's it's the listening, but hearing your, yourself answer the question, whether it be verbally or whether it be in a written form. I think you, you targeted that. Is that, how, where's that in its importance? Well, and there's there's two sides uh, that I think of when you ask that question or you say that is that there's there's our outer voice, but then obviously for all of us during this crisis, we have an inner voice too. And so we can not only ask other people questions, but one of the great things obviously to do during this time as a leader is to make sure that you're asking yourself the right question, <clears throat> right? Because questions actually influence language and language has the highest influence on reality. Questions influence language, language influences reality. So the questions that we ask ourselves and we ask, ask each other actually adjust the frame that we see our life through. And that's, that's a key component to coaching. And uh, we're jumping ahead to the next session, but uh, uh, that's always lots of fun. We're actually using some of this stuff in our, learn, our uh, lunch and learns that we're doing with companies so that your people can have this language also. That's wonderful. And I really do encourage everyone that if you have the ability to, to uh, book Ryan for one of these lunch and learns, I think your staff and, and your, your team are going to learn a lot from it and gain some greater perspective on, and come together Ryan, we're, we're out of time here, and I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who was on the call and, and from Tech Canada. We appreciate your coaching, your wisdom, your leadership in this, and uh, we're just all better people right now. <laughs> and moving forward. <laughs> well, thank forward. you, Ruth, and, and, and a big thanks to all your people uh, in Tech Canada. You know I love tech, and I love the process. I think it's brilliant. And over the years, and it's been many years now, uh, I have loved being part of your process. Thank you, Ryan. I want to remind everybody that the recording for this will be available on our website. Just under look under COVID insights and webinars. So you can uh, share this with other people who will see value and will receive the, uh, the insight that Ryan has presented today. So tomorrow, we're going to follow up on this. We're going to have Major Mark Gasparato, who led teams in Kandahar, talking again about that inner game of leadership. So it's a, it's a lovely segue from, from Ryan. We just got top leaders moving forward and, and helping us all be better. So thanks again, Ryan. Have a fabulous day. Thanks, everybody.